I'll talk faster. Okay, so I got to say, got it, right? <laughs> um, Take it away, Phil. Okay, so my talk today is about raptors. And as you know, the name raptor is a, a misnomer because um, basically raptors are modern birds and uh, these dinosaurs are not raptors. These, the name raptor got uh, fixed on these animals uh, because of the movie Jurassic Park mostly and uh, has stuck. And um, of course, because of the uh, tremendous popularity of the Jurassic Park movies, they've, uh, uh, the names become famous worldwide. And so to a lot of people, uh, the name does not mean the basketball team, it means these dinosaurs. And these little dinosaurs are uh, chicken to ostrich size, basically, uh, but they're animals that, uh, uh, were very well known uh, from late Cretaceous beds of the Northern Hemisphere in particular, uh, but there have been reports of them from South America and um, South Africa as well. So there are there, um, animals that uh, uh, as time goes on become better known. Now let's see what's going on here. Okay, so what I wanted to say was that uh, uh, there are a lot of dinosaurs and uh, Alberta in particular is very gifted with dinosaurs. In uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park, uh, we have over 50 species of dinosaurs that have been uh, identified over the years. Some of the names are uh, changing and uh, uh, it's one of the problems with paleontology. But uh, one of the big problems with a place like Dinosaur Park is that um, it's uh, got a preservational bias, which uh, works in favor of large animals being preserved and small animals are not well preserved. Um, so whether you're talking about babies of big dinosaurs or just species of small dinosaurs or all of the other animals that live with dinosaurs, um, which were not big animals, um, any of those small things don't get preserved all that well. And it's partly because of tyrannosaurs. Uh, tyrannosaurs, of course, had uh, these enormous mouths and uh, uh, something like a human being would be two bites and it's gone. And uh, as soon as you're swallowed, uh, you're not gonna leave much fossil evidence. Uh, another factor is that the, um, the paleo environment at the time was a very active river system. And that river system would break up skeletons and scatter them. Uh, but the bigger you are, the less likely you are to get scattered. And the much better chance you have of the skeletons holding together long enough to get fossilized. Um, long and short of it is that uh, on this list, all of those things marked in orange are animals that uh, are generally known from only a few bones. Uh, they're certainly not known from whole skeletons. And if you look at uh, uh, Troodontidae and Dromaeosauridae, these are the, uh, the ones we would call raptors. Uh, very few of them have good skeletons representing them. Um, the first raptor found ever was actually in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And uh, this is Barnum Brown and his expeditions of the American Museum of Natural History to the park back in 1915. And at that time, they found uh, a partial skull and a little bit of a skeleton of an animal that took the name Dromaeosaurus. Now, Dromaeosaurus is... Uh, not exactly well preserved, as you can see from the specimen, but this is most of the skull of uh, the first raptor. And Dromaeosaurus is, uh, uh, you know, very obviously a carnivore. It's got the sharp teeth. Uh, no claws were found, although some of the uh, uh, toe and finger bones were found. And uh, so for a long time, from the time that this dinosaur was uh, named, uh, this dinosaur was just really questionable as to whether, in fact, it was a separate genus and species, or maybe a baby of a tyrannosaur or something else. There was a lot of argument about it. 
And uh, this is a skeleton we mounted uh, for Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, you can see it's got a beautiful skull and skeleton. Well, the skeleton, in fact, is based on about four or five different uh, skeletons of different genera even uh, from Dinosaur Provincial Park. Because at the time we mounted the skeleton, we had no, uh, no idea really what the skeleton looked like, except for the fact that uh, we had other raptors by this point from other parts of the world that told us roughly what the skeleton should look like. Now, the second raptor that was found was found in Mongolia. And this is the photograph of, again, the American Museum of Natural History, this time working in Mongolia. Uh, the Campbell train was, in fact, uh, supplying gas for their vehicles. Uh, they were using cars and trucks, but no gas stations in Mongolia. So uh, they all came out by camel train, and then the camels carried the specimens out of the desert, and the expedition functioned that way. The lower picture is a picture taken um, in more recent times of the same place. So there's no problem going back to uh, the same uh, sites and quarries in this part of uh, Mongolia or the Gobi Desert. Um, but uh, of course, notes and things from that time period really weren't all that accurate and or that detailed. So we can't really find our way back to the original Velociraptor um, site. This is what uh, exists of the original Velociraptor that was found in 1923. Uh, it's a skull and there's one finger bone with a claw. And uh, um, so again, you could tell it was a small carnivorous dinosaur, um, but in some ways you couldn't really understand the relationships of this dinosaur all that well. Um, much better specimens of Velociraptor have been found since. And this is one that was found uh, by the Polish Mongolian expeditions in 1981. To me, this is the most remarkable specimen in the world. Uh, of a dinosaur uh, because uh, what you see is two dinosaurs that were interacting together when they died and got buried. So where the cursor is right now is a skull of a plant-eating dinosaur called a protoceratops. The other skeleton, whoops, didn't want to do that. Well, the other skeleton is uh, a velociraptor. And you can see it's laid out here on its side. The protoceratops is upright. The velociraptor has one hand which goes through the mouth of the protoceratops and clasps the, the side of the face. The other hand is on the other side of the face holding onto it. And uh, the legs are uh, folded in such a way that the big raptorial claw of the velociraptor is in the chest of the protoceratops. Now the protoceratops, before it died, closed its mouth on the arm of the velociraptor. It doesn't look like closed mouth here because the top part of the beak has been eroded off. But if um, that beak hadn't been eroded off, it would have closed on top of the, this, this arm bone. So it's a remarkable specimen. I think what happened here is that um, the uh, protoceratops was basically hiding behind a sand dune uh, during a sandstorm. The velociraptor, like some modern animals, was hunting behind the sand dune during the sandstorm because it knows that the herbivores will sometimes seek shelter on the leeward side of the dune. And uh, it attacked the protoceratops. Unfortunately for the uh, Velociraptor, before the uh, Protoceratops died, um, the Protoceratops locked its jaws on the arm of the Velociraptor, and then the two of them got buried as the sand continued to accumulate. And so we have this pretty remarkable scene. Now, the next Raptor that got discovered was found in Montana in 1964. And it was found by John Ostrom. And really, uh, the popularity of dinosaurs that started in the 1970s can be attributed to the discovery of this particular raptor. It's an animal called Deinonychus. And uh, this is the real animal that's actually in Jurassic Park, not Velociraptor. Uh, but at some point, uh, people were talking about maybe Deinonychus and Velociraptor and Dromaeosaurus were all the same animal and uh, used the name Velociraptor. 
uh, which turned out not to be the case. Uh, this is actually lower Cretaceous in age. John Ostrom was the person who described it, and uh, he also uh, showed us what it was really like. Uh, so when you look at the foot, it was the first time it was recognized that these things had this incredible second toe, which was raised off the ground, folded essentially to keep it that way, and uh, had an enlarged uh, and very strongly curved claw. Um, the first digit, in fact, is the hallux. Uh, we have somebody here at the university working on the hall hallucies now of uh, these little dinosaurs and birds as well, because it's, it's very interesting what goes on. So um, that turned out to be a character that nobody was expecting based on the skulls of Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor. There were other characters as well that were very interesting. So for example, the uh, arms of these dinosaurs are very long. And when you, you look at the tail, there are these long bony, whoa, I did it again. Long bony um, extensions of the zygopophyses and uh, the hemal arches. And basically these uh, bony extensions uh, stiffened the tail up. And uh, presumably that had a lot to do with its locomotion. Now Ostrom uh, realized very quickly that there were a lot of similarities between uh, the earliest birds that we knew of, including Archaeopteryx uh, from the late Jurassic of uh, Germany, and uh, the little raptors that uh, he was looking at when he was studying Deinonychus. The first specimen of uh, Archaeopteryx was found in 1861, so more than 100 years ago. Huxley, uh, back around that time in the 1870s, um, postulated that birds, in fact, were the direct descendants of dinosaurs based on this and a few other specimens that were recovered of Archaeopteryx. And in fact, if you look at the Archaeopteryx and you uh, took this, the feathers away, if the feathers had not been preserved, you would identify it as a little carnivorous dinosaur because the fingers are free. There's three, fing three, three free fingers. Uh, same with the toes, they look very much like uh, what we see in Deinonychus. Uh, there's a long bony tail, there's teeth in the jaws, um, and in so many ways they're, they're very, very similar. So in uh, 1974, um, Ostrom took the idea that had been uh, put forward by Huxley more than 100 years before and pointed out all of the dinosaur characters of Archaeopteryx uh, especially in comparison with Deinonychus. So one of the reasons that um, the uh, uh, animals we're now talking about became so important and so interesting is because of the fact that they showed a very clear connection with birds. Now, uh, this is a lady who farmed near Dinosaur Provincial Park, or what's now Dinosaur Provincial Park. And Irene Vanderloo in 1974, found a skeleton of a small meat-eating dinosaur. And you'd think, well, um, you know, this is a long time after the first Dromaeosaurus was found. We probably found another Dromaeosaurus. However, that wasn't the case. It turned out to be a brand new type of dinosaur. And that was recognized by a University of Alberta graduate named of uh, Hans Dieter Seuss. And uh, Hans, uh, uh, realized that this was a more gracile animal than Dromaeosaurus. Um, and then in fact, it was very similar to the Velociraptor specimens found um, some 40 years earlier in Mongolia. And so he set up a new species, species uh, on the basis of the material that was discovered. The material in fact went to what's now the Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And uh, um, of course is our our library card, I guess you could say, on this particular type of animal. And uh, here is a uh, composite skeleton that we put together. Uh, it was based partly on a skeleton from Dinosaur Provincial Park, partly on a type specimen, partly on this uh, maxilla or upper jaw bone, um, and partly on a specimen from Mongolia. And again, uh, the original specimen that Irene Vanderloo had found in Dinosaur Park was not complete. 
but there was enough of it there, uh, including the skull roof, uh, some teeth, part of the lower jaw, and parts of the skeleton to show us what kind of dinosaur it was. But uh, again, um, because of that preservational bias that exists in Dinosaur Provincial Park, it, uh, we were cheated again out of knowing exactly what the whole animal looked like. And this caused some problems because people started to argue about whether or not Sornithelestes was in fact Velociraptor. And uh, um, that of course has a, a big impact on our understanding of the paleoecology and uh, paleobiogeography and the migration of dinosaurs and the movement of dinosaurs between North America and Asia. Now, the teeth on this animal though are very distinctive. And uh, when you look at the back of the tooth, you see these uh, uh, serrations that look very different than what we see in Dromaeosaurus or Tyrannosaurus. These serrations have a long straight base and they're hooked towards the end. And more importantly, I think the serrations on the front of the tooth are much smaller than the serrations on the back of the tooth. And that tells us something because um, even though we don't find much in the way of articulated skeletons of small animals, we do find isolated bones all the time. And more than 1,500 catalog teeth uh, at the University of Alberta and the Terrell Museum of Paleontology belong to this type of dinosaur. And it suggests to us that this type of dinosaur is not a rare animal at all. Um, the uh, number of teeth and the numbers of other bones suggests that uh, it may in fact be quite common. So these are the raptorial claws from that second digit in the foot, the can opener claw. And uh, there's more than a hundred of these in the Terrell Museum and U of A collections. Again, that tells us it's not a very rare animal. Um, so we should find eventually, as long as we keep looking, um, a more complete skeleton of, of this animal and it'll cease to be a mystery at some point. Uh, before that happened, though, um, this dinosaur turned up, and this is a very small fist-sized uh, specimen, and uh, this, in fact, was collected by uh, somebody who worked uh, a couple of summers for the University of Alberta, and she was collecting down in Dinosaur Provincial Park, and her name was uh, Betsy Nichols, or Elizabeth Nichols. And uh, in 1978, Betsy found uh, this little specimen. She didn't know what it was. And frankly, none of the rest of us did either. Uh, it was very unusual looking. It's, a, it's obviously a pelvis uh, where you have the ilium and the ischium uh, fused together. Uh, it's a relatively mature animal and that's what the fusion says, but it's very small. And the best guess anybody had was that it was a lizard. However, uh, 30 years later, we had one of the students going through the collections and he ran across this and he realized that this is very, very similar to something else that had recently been found in China. And uh, that animal, um, well, I should point out one character first, is that when you look at the pubis, the pubis has this very distinctive kink in it and a little process here partway down the shaft of the pubis. And this animal had turned up um, around the turn of this century. And this is an animal called Microraptor, but there's related animals from China as well. And uh, this Microraptor is in fact, one of the raptors that's distantly related to Deinonychus or to Sauronithelestes or to Velociraptor, but it's much smaller. It's, it's bird size, basically, uh, your average size bird that is and it has feathers preserved with it. And it has long feathers behind the arms, but also long feathers below, um, behind the, the legs. Whoops, uh, real trouble with this one. <laughs> and um, the pubis though, it has that very distinctive kink. And uh, uh, having most of my trouble here when I, every time I touch the uh, uh, cursor to show you something, but uh, we'll run that risk again. And right here, the pubis is kinked and it has that little process on it. So uh, the student, Nick Longrich at the time realized that uh, this is an animal that's related to that uh, very small pelvis that was found in Dinosaur Provincial Park. 
And uh, uh, I guess it's kind of an announcement. One of our students recently uh, took that to try and interpret the information on uh, why the pelvis is kinked and what that process means. And uh, Matt Rhodes uh, published this last year in the um, Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and it was picked as the uh, best student article of the journal for last year. So uh, that's uh, something we just learned a couple of weeks ago. Now we have other microraptor bones. Um, they do turn up in both the collections, the Trail Museum and the University of Alberta. They look very much like Sornopolestes bones, but they're much smaller. Uh, we can tell they're from uh, a small animal though, because the, uh, the bone structure actually shows us that these are not immature animals. These are mature animals. They just happen to be much smaller than Sornopolestes. Near the Trail Museum of Paleontology, um, we have, of course, Badlands, and the Badlands represent a different age than down at Dinosaur Provincial Park. But this little dinosaur turned up in the 1990s, and uh, this is an animal we call Velociraptor. It looks in some ways very similar to Sornopolestes, but the face is much more abbreviated and deeper, and the teeth are inclined backwards towards the throat, and uh, so we gave this name, the, uh, or sorry, we gave this dinosaur the name Atrociraptor, but it shows us there's quite a variety of these things in Southern Alberta. Then up in Grand Prairie, this is the area that uh, Corwin Sullivan's been doing most of his work, but uh, many years ago, we actually found in the Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed, a uh, uh, frontal bone, and the frontal is from top of the skull between the the eyes essentially and i'll be mentioning this on and off uh, throughout the talk but uh, this frontal bone although it was badly eroded is in fact very different than the frontals of either uh, sornitholestes or dromaeosaurus and uh, it turns out that these are um, bones that uh, uh, remain relatively constant in their overall shape and we know that because in recent years we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Sornitholestes frontals from Dinosaur Provincial Park and we have many of these and they they always look the same uh, the same as the frontals in the middle of the picture and very different than what we see in Boreanicus from uh, Grand Prairie or Dromaeosaurus from Dinosaur Park as well and that's a artistic uh, reconstruction, what Boreonychus may have looked like. Now our uh, luck changed in 2014. And at that time we were looking at a, an area of Dinosaur Provincial Park, very close to where the type specimen of Sornitholestes had been found by Irene Vanderloh back in 1974. And uh, Clive Coy, our head technician, was walking through the Badlands and he was walking through an area uh, where we really didn't expect to find anything because we'd walked there so many times over the years. Uh, but he just happened to look the right way and notice that there were a couple of little toe bones coming out of the uh, area we were walking across, basically right across the path. And uh, so he uh, focused some attention on it. We went back and uh, we found uh, most of the skeleton of a Sornopolestes. This is only about 300 meters from where the type specimen came from. And uh, uh, so we plastered it out. And uh, just as a curious thing, this is uh, Bruce Vanderloh, the uh, grandson of Irene Vanderloh, who helped us pull the dinosaur out of the Badlands. And uh, it turned out to be an absolutely remarkable specimen. Uh, it's more or less complete. Uh, we're missing the last half of the tail, uh, but uh, we had the base of the tail and the base of the tail very clearly showed these uh, rod-like structures that run along the tail. And uh, they're very similar to what we knew already existed for Sornitholestes. And in fact, we have two Sornitholestes tails that were excavated from Dinosaur Provincial Park that don't have the rest of the skeleton, but the end of the tail is there. Uh, it's kind of fun looking at these ossified tendons because in fact, uh, you can see that they're bent in this specimen. And it shows us that although these are bones or ossified, 
they are in fact capable of bending to to an extent and uh, fundamentally this uh, um, cable like structure that ran along the sides of the tail stiffened the tail but didn't stop it from um, moving uh, to a certain extent or flexing to a certain extent. This is the skull and the skull was uh, uh, absolutely beautiful uh, as far as paleontologists are concerned. And uh, we learned a lot about what Soranopelestes looked like for the first time. Uh, you may remember the picture I showed of a Troceraptor, but a Troceraptor has this bulldog face. Soranopelestes, the face is much longer and lower. It's a little bit closer to what we see in Velociraptor, but still nowhere near the same. And uh, so now we know we have a slightly abbreviated skull of something like Velociraptor but uh, not as abbreviated as what we see in this dinosaur that we found in the Drumheller area uh, that we called a Troceraptor. And uh, here's a reconstruction. In some ways, uh, it shows some relationships to Dromaeosaurus, um, the very first raptorial dinosaur that was found down in Dinosaur Provincial Park. But it clearly is, clearly is a very different animal too. A big surprise on it, though, was when we were preparing the teeth on this specimen, we found that the teeth at the front of the jaws, uh, basically the dinosaurian equivalent of in incisors, had these uh, incredible ridges on them uh, that extended from the top of the tooth to the tip of the tooth. And uh, so the incisors are very distinctive in their appearance. And uh, you can see that uh, the serrations at the front of the teeth are much smaller than the serrations at the back of the teeth. That's, that's very similar to what we see in the back teeth of Sornithelestes. But uh, they're very unlike uh, the other incisors that we find in other carnivorous dinosaurs. And the amazing thing is that um, this kind of tooth had been described as early as 1870 and named down in Montana. And so there were two types of dinosaurs that um, have these uh, teeth with ridges on them. One's called Paranicodon and one's called Zapsalis. And both named in 1870. So in all probability, uh, Sornithelestes is the same thing as uh, we believe actually Zapsalis. And uh, at some point, um, this dinosaur may end up getting renamed. Now, the problem is that um, We've now found that in other raptors, uh, including Velociraptor, they actually have the same kind of teeth, these very distinctive teeth. And because we're finding other genera and species of raptors in North America, we're not sure what we can associate the name Zapsalis with. So for now, the name Sorenthalestes uh, stands. Um, the skeleton was very interesting too, and uh, the white arrows here are pointing to some processes that uh, extend from the ribs. Uh, Corwin has a student, Yan Yin, who has work, been working on uncinate processes and birds, dinosaurs, and other animals. And uh, these were things that weren't even recognized in dinosaurs not that long ago. But uh, it's not a surprise that in bird-like dinosaurs that uh, uh, these processes have been found because they would have been breathing and, uh, um, well, other things uh, similar to, to their descendants, the birds. This is the raptorial claw on the foot, and uh, uh, the two red arrows are pointing uh, to the front and back of uh, something that has a very different texture than the bone itself. And this is actually ossified or fossilized, we'll say, keratin. And uh, it's, uh, you know, basically your fingernails. Uh, and this is the soft part of the soft anatomy. It's something that doesn't normally preserve with dinosaurs down in Dinosaur Provincial Park, but um, keratin sometimes does preserve in association with the claws. So you can see that the um, raptorial claw of the Sornithelestes that would have been raised above the ground was greatly extended in length by, well, maybe a, a quarter to a third of its length um, by the keratin of the fingernail itself and would have come to an incredibly sharp point, which again 
reasserts that uh, we know that this animal was in fact a carnivore. And uh, uh, just a CAT scan, uh, longitudinal, uh, you can see the uh, difference between the keratin and the bone on that claw. Uh, we've also sectioned uh, some of the bones and uh, discovered that uh, there are lines of arrested growth inside the uh, long bones. And uh, they tell us that this animal was probably about 12 years old when it died and that it had stopped, stopped growing at that time. Uh, this is a pretty incredible part though too. Um, the specimen was prepared in uh, Japan on display, part of it. Uh, Clive basically took it over there and um, got a huge audience, like 3 million people saw it in uh, half a year or so. But while he was preparing it there, he realized that uh, there was something wrong with the front of the skeleton. And uh, the green arrow points to a bone that uh, is a humerus from another dinosaur. Uh, here's the humerus here of the Sorinithalestes, and you can see what the size of it is like. This is the head of a humerus of uh, probably an ostrich mimic dinosaur. And uh, um, that humerus uh, goes into the body cavity of this dinosaur and has uh, ribs on both sides of it. Um, there's no question that what happened in this case is that this is what killed the dinosaur because he got a little bit gluttonous like a lot of modern animals do, and he tried to bite off more than he can chew, and he probably choked to death. Now, this is just a shot of some Komodo dragons that uh, we witnessed feeding on a, a wild boar in Indonesia uh, some 10 years ago. And uh, this big Komodo dragon, which was almost three meters long, picked up the skull of the, or the head of the uh, um, pig, and uh, he couldn't swallow it, even though, of course, he has flexible jaws. And to, to do that, he walked up to a tree and pushed his head against the tree until the head of the wild boar was forced down his throat. Um, so there are many, many examples of everything from fish to mammals that uh, end up dying because they end up choking when they try and take something too big. And in the case of that Sornithalastes, that's almost certainly what happened to it. Um, it bit off far more than it could have or should have. Clive also noticed when he was preparing the specimen that there was these uh, long tube-like structures inside the body. And these uh, tube-like structures uh, uh, were just a different kind of sediment. And so what we did was we drilled into that different kind of sediment, and then we had it analyzed. And we found that uh, um, the composition of that part, as opposed to the composition of the rest of the contents of the body cavity or the contents or the sediments outside of the body, had uh, a tremendous amount of appetite inside. And so almost certainly this was bone that had been dissolved uh, and was in the large intestine of this little dinosaur. So again, uh, some pretty remarkable things you can find out from well-preserved specimens. I'm just gonna go back to the frontal for a little while and say that uh, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, recently on the frontals found down in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, Sornithalestes, the frontals are very, very consistent. All, all of them look exactly the same, more or less, except for differences in size and so on. And so we feel uh, much stronger and much more confident when we look at uh, isolated frontals in terms of being able to identify them. And uh, another bone that uh, turns out to be uh, very good for identifying these dinosaurs is the, the maxilla. And uh, the maxilla, again, uh, is something we're, we're studying uh, in terms of a lot of uh, isolated specimens. And uh, uh, we've noticed uh, that the bone is so good that in fact, uh, we can build our phy phylogenies of these dinosaurs based on just the maxilla and it reflects what uh, we find in whole specimens. 
Uh, doesn't always work. Um, so one of our specimens took a much closer look, or one of our students rather, took a much closer look at this. And uh, Mark Powers has this in press now. Uh, this is not Sornithlesis, this is Deinonychus. And Deinonychus uh, didn't fit the, um, the pattern we were seeing uh, in the sense that uh, it had more teeth uh, than the other raptors. Uh, but what Mark found by uh, taking CAT scans and uh, uh, splicing them all together, uh, he realized that the reason it had more teeth is because the specimen that was supposed to be all one maxilla, in fact, was a maxilla with a piece of the premaxilla and two premaxillary teeth um, glued onto the front of the maxilla. And so, in fact, that reduced the number of teeth in Deinonychus and brings it more in line with the other raptors that we find in um, North America. Now, uh, small enigmatic theropods are a lot of fun to work on because of the fact that um, they are rare and uh, yet they're very diverse. They're animals that are related to birds. They're animals that uh, almost certainly had feathers based on what we know from the Chinese specimens. Uh, they're animals that uh, show relationships to the specimens from China and Mongolia, and yet they're a little bit different. And uh, uh, because they're rare and because they're important, uh, it's just a lot of fun to work on these animals. And so a lot of our attention in recent years has been towards trying to find even isolated bones and teeth of these animals so that we can come up with a much better understanding of what they're like. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. And I'm clapping. You, you have to see all of the, <laughs> yeah. the, the little cartoon hands to, to appreciate the, the response. I love this last slide that you ended on. That's amazing. <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions for Phil? Anybody at all? I don't. I think Aaron's got a raised hand, according to my screen, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Phil, Go ahead. One of one of the pictures you showed, you were talking about the uncinate processes, and unless I miss, which I am sure I probably did, but it looked like the uncinate processes crossed two ribs, which in birds would indicate, you know, is something about the ca chest cavity not wanting to compress due to diving or something. Was I seeing things, or is there a reason for that? Uh. Well, probably Corwin might be better to answer that at this point because of his student. But um, yeah, no, there is no question that it does cross uh, two and it does in other um, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs as well. Um, but uh, there's also no question these aren't animals who were diving. <laughs> So yeah, right. So it'd be interesting to know why that might be. I mean, because like, you know, loons show it and all and some of the cormorants show it, but no passerin does and, you know, all of the smaller birds. So it's yeah. interesting. Hmm. Okay. Cool. I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions for Phil? Lots of good stories that come out of your fossils, literally. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's fun to pursue them. You wouldn't think you'd be able to do it, but uh, they, in fact, yeah. Yeah. Um, as time goes on, there's more and more ways to approach these things. Heather, I see you have your hand up. Yep, that was really cool, Phil. Um, so when do you think you'll next be able to get back to Mongolia, or do you have any plans to, to go there? Well, we, uh, we hope to get back next summer because next summer is the 100th anniversary of the American Museum of Natural History expedition uh, that went there first in uh, 1922. And uh, so the Mongolians are planning all kinds of festivities. Uh, they've invited us to go and uh, we're really hoping we can go at that time. Oh, that sounds uh, like it would be a wonderful party. Yeah, yes. absolutely. <laughs> any, any travel by camel involved? Uh, no, but we've been on camels. I mean, I've been on a bucking camel even. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you got to get that on a slide. Time. Yeah, exactly. I think was, somebody filmed it actually. <laughs> I managed Ow. to stay on. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm just wondering with, with some of these small parts, like the, the prominent claw that 
you know, is, is so uh, recognizable by people. Do you tend to get those sorts of parts turned in by the public uh, more so or less so than you might expect? I'd say less so in the sense that um, I would be willing to bet that with uh, teeth and claws that they're the ones that disappear the fastest <laughs> and, and just, even though it's uh, illegal for that to be picked up in the park, for example, or even under Alberta laws without uh, permits. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, I mean, they're just too pretty, but they do go home. But uh, still very significant fines are turned over by the public to us. Um, you know, in fact, Sornithalestes is a good example because that was by one of the local ranchers, um, Irene Vanderloo. Very cool. Aaron, did you have another question or did you just leave your hand up? I just left my hand up. Okay. Sorry. Just, just checking, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, well if all. not, please join me in thanking Phil for a very engaging and entertaining seminar. Thank you so much for being here, Phil, and for speaking at the Chairs Lecture Series. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great night and hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>